Good evening, ladies and gentlemen and councillors. Uh, welcome to the Cabinet meeting of the 23rd of February 2023. So we'll go straight into the agenda uh, with apologies for absence. We've received apologies from Councillor Summers, who has yet again got COVID. Uh, apologies from uh, Councillor Pritchard, who is also unwell, uh, and from Councillor Bailey, uh, who also has a chest infection. So those apologies are to be recorded. Item two on the agenda are uh, minutes of the previous meeting. Your wish I sign those as true record. That's been moved by Councillor Clements, seconded by Councillor Farrell. All those in favour? That is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, item three, declarations of interest. Does anybody have any pecuniary or non-pecuniary interest they need to declare? No, there are none. So straight into agenda item four, which is question time. Uh, this time we have a question from a member of the public. Uh, so hand over to Mr. Hugh Loxton. Thank you. It was very encouraging to read about the first meeting of Litchfield District Youth Council earlier this month. The meeting was attended by 30 young people and they will meet monthly going forwards. This, this gives young people a voice, allows their views to be heard and encourages engagement on decisions which impact them. It brings about an interest in local democracy and may even see these young people go on to become councillors in the future. Bearing all that in mind, could you, please, could you please confirm if there are currently any plans in place for a Tamworth Borough Youth Council? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Loxton. Uh, councillor Clements, would you like to respond? Thank you, Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr Loxton, for your question. It's always a privilege that, you, that people take the time to look at my portfolio role and see what I do. Um, I was too really pleased to hear about the neighbouring council's decision to introduce the youth council. I work quite closely with Councillor Richard Cox in Litchfield District Council on county level, um, so I knew what he was planning and we're, we're just a little bit behind. Um, as you've already said, I wholeheartedly support your comments that these young people may well be our next community leaders um, and being part of a youth council is a great introduction to local politics and an opportunity for the council to engage with the youth of this town. A youth council would give young people the chance to discuss relevant issues, engage with decision makers and contribute to improving the lives of young people within the Tamworth and the surrounding areas. So for me, it's a win-win situation all round. And by generating interest now, this will pay dividends when these youngsters become informed residents in their own right. Um, in my portfolio, I would love to see this council bring back the youth council and I'm already currently working with officers to make the necessary arrangements. Um, obviously, this takes time and um, resources. And if you've read the Litchfield District Council um, report, they had £60,000 worth of funding to get it off the ground over three years. Uh, we just need to look at where we can get that funding from. Um, I'm fully, fully supported of the reintroduction of a local youth council. That would be a forum that represent the views of young people in Tamworth. It would be run, right, run by young people, for young people, giving young people a voice and enabling them to make their views heard in the decision-making process. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Clements. Uh, Mr Loxton, do you have a supplementary? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clements. That's really good to hear. The only thing I would say is obviously you mentioned the funding there and you're voting on the budget next week, I think. Is there anything in that budget set aside for a youth council at all? Thank you. Councillor Clements? Uh, not at this present time because obviously we're only just doing this now so we're going to have to look for funding for next year but that doesn't say we can't get it off the ground that doesn't mean so we can't do something ourselves um, and then look at funding for future years thank you councillor clements thank you mr loxton okay that completes uh question time uh so we will now move on to item <laughs> Five on the agenda, which is matters referred to Cabinet in accordance with overview and scrutiny procedurals. Uh, this evening we have a report uh, from the Corporate Scrutiny Committee. Uh, it is in the name of the Chairman of the Committee. Uh, however, I appreciate that Chairman has sent his apologies this evening. Uh, and I've had a request from the Deputy Chairman and two people who were involved in the working group to present the report. Uh, so if I could hand over to Councillor Daniel Cook to introduce the report. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, first and foremost, uh, credit 
uh, for this piece of work really needs to go to Councillor Chris Cook and Councillor Michelle Cook, who not only have met re regularly with the residents involved in this matter, they drove the working group, they drove the research. So I'm here as the vice chair of the committee to present this and give you the upfront information, but any technical questions need to go to these two absolutely great community champions who have not let go of the bit on this one and are really are driving it. So from a personal perspective, thanks to them both for really driving this agenda. Uh, as you say, Mr Chairman, it's a recommendation from corporate scrutiny. Uh, we took around two, two and a half months to really look into legislation, incl including the Common Hold and Leaseholder Reform Act and other pieces of legislation around how leaseholders get into the position we're talking about today. Uh, we've looked back at historic council communications on how this has unfolded over the last three or four years, obviously except COVID got involved in the middle. I've personally stood in front of the residents and offered my apologies because I was the leader of this council at the start of this process, so I thought I should offer up my apologies, certainly. Um, where we've got to, Mr Chairman, is I think there has been a slight breakdown in communication with residents on this one. I think the working group, which was cross-party amongst Conservatives, Labour and the independent group, felt that I think we could have handled the communications a little bit better. I will caveat that with no officer has broken any laws and no officer has stepped outside their bounds. It's just I think there is some learning we could certainly implement from this process. Uh, there are some recommendations in front of you. I'll quickly read out the seven that the working group came up with that then went through corporate scrutiny unanimous. One, that the council look at using independent assessor for works to confirm costs were correct. Two, that an assessment be done for all repairs in advance of leaseholders being asked to contribute to repairs. Three, to reinforce the council's communications when residents buy a council house, including what responsibilities and obligations were on the only occupier. Four, that the communications relating to the leaseholder works be reviewed and simplified. Five, that the contractor hold at least two face-to-face -face consultation drop-ins to enable residents to understand the process. Six, that the, this is the key one for us, that the specific 44 leaseholder roofs be assessed straight away. We've put some residents through some pain and we don't even know for 100% if these roofs need doing. Seven, that the council consider a mechanism such as the affected 44 leaseholders were not faced with increased costs as a result of the delay in works that are still yet to be commenced by our own internal review. I think where we are key, key Mr Chairman, is we've identified that under the process of our stock conditions survey, 20% of similar properties are assessed and then the rest are put through a matrix and we make a rough estimate of do these roofs need doing or not. There stands a good chance under probability not a single roof we're talking about today is actually being looked at. We're guessing. And that has been accepted by senior officers. That is the process we follow. There comes a chance that we've put 44 residents through some extreme pain and worry over the last few years, worrying about £36,000 for their roof that might not need doing because the assessor goes out after the consultation period is finished. We understand from the point of Tamworth Borough Council, from a financial perspective, that is correct from us and protects our budgets. However, it puts some vulnerable residents in a very precarious position that might not need to be in. It reminds me very much of the garage projects a few years ago that myself and Councillor Pritchard, the Deputy Leader Council, had to put a stop to because we did a raft of consultation with residents, upset them and then found we couldn't deliver the projects anyway. I think we need to pause and actually look at how we do these communications. As I say, no office has broken any laws, they followed the process, but I think we can learn from this and certainly deliver better moral outcomes to our residents. And firstly, let's get these roofs looked at because we don't even know if these residents need to be suffering this way. I don't know if uh, Councillor Cook or Councillor Cook have anything to add. There's too many cooks here today, I do apologise. Um, but uh, I'll hand over. Councillor Chris Cook. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, I mean, as I um, uh, got involved in all this, it has been a rather long kind of process. There has actually been a uh, uh, load of research that's actually kind of gone on. Um, uh, so we've had evidence of officers, I've also often uh, residents as well and that's been absolutely uh, fantastic because we don't always have the extra res have extra evidence of uh, 
Uh, members of the public as well. And the key issue is, because um, I have the costs, then I have their actual assessment, and then they will have an extra list that says it, it's either not actually needed, but this bit, this bit, and this bit is, which is quite nearly kind of this much. If that was just step back a bit, so all of the actual assessments were kind of there, just so that I were that we kind of know it's only this bit or this bit that kind of needs uh, 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 doing, etc. Then almost all of this wouldn't have actually happened anyway. But all I really want to sort of say is, I mean, all of my years as a councillor anyway, this um, uh, bit of scrutiny which we've been um, had on this area is the most in an evolved um, bit of scrutiny which I have ever sat on over it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Councillor Michelle Cook. Thanks. Um, there's not really a huge amount to add other than the other, um, what the other councillors have said. Um, tonight, I just want to say a personal thanks again to Councillor Goodall, who's sitting here at the back as well, um, and Councillors Harper and Councillor People as well um, for their involvement, because um, an awful lot of time and effort, and which is, again, what we're here today. But it, it, on Sunday nights and all sorts, sitting and going through some of the information. And again, thanks to the residents for all of their and I'll say support, but also their patience as well, because it has been, as Councillor Danny Cook has said, has been incredibly challenging for them. And some of the personal stories that we've heard um, has been really quite difficult to hear as well. Um, I mean, again, from my perspective, I think this is, as Chris Cook's just said, a really good piece of scrutiny work, which the whole committee got behind and subject to yourselves kind of voting for the recommendations this evening. Actually, this is an opportunity to improve what we're here for um, and what we're here to do um, and ultimately ensure that we offer the best possible service for our residents. And that's what each and every one of us got involved in this today. So um, over to yourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Does the committee, the committee, does the cabinet have any questions for the working group or for the uh, vice chairman of the scrutiny committee? Councillor Clements. Just a comment, thank you, Chair. Um, one of the recommendations is communication, um, and I think communication is key to everything that we do. We look to our residents all the time to talk to us. We have to, ha we have, they have to accept, expect the same back from us as a council. Um, and again, I want to reiterate what Councillor Michelle Cooks just said. Thank you for taking the time to come this evening. It's cold. It's February. Um, but we as a cabinet realise how important this is to you all and I'm glad that you can now see the process of how we deliver things and how we can move forward, fingers crossed, um, at a bit of a speedier pace than it has been. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Clements. Are there any questions for the working group? No? In that case, uh, thank the three members for, for presenting this evening uh, and thank the whole of the working group for the for the work they've they've done over the last over the last I think you said two and a half months, um, I think it probably extends a bit before then when first meetings were held with uh, with residents. Um, Councillor Farrell, this sits within your portfolio. Could you respond to the cabinet, please? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. And I'd like to extend my thanks to the working group. They've done a really really good job so far, um, and I hope this kind of scrutiny can continue actually because. As they have said, it is a difficult process for everyone, and, and and there's so many layers involved. So, if it's okay with you, Chair, I'll I'll go through each of the um, seven recommendations and and kind of take them one by one because I think just voting them on block wouldn't wouldn't be appropriate this time. If that's okay with you, um, 
Number one says that the council looks at using an independent assessor for works to confirm whether the costs were correct. Um, I think as a one-off, that's definitely something we could and should do. Um, we can have the process assessed to ensure that the best value for money is used across our procurement of the repairs contract. Um, there will, of course, be a, a cost to that. Um, and, you know, the housing revenue account doesn't have its own money, of course. It's funded by leaseholders and rent payers. Um, so, you know, these are the people that would have to foot the bill. But I think I'm happy to move uh, as a one-off on this occasion. We will look at the independent assessor for the works on each of these properties to confirm the costs were correct, if my cabinet colleagues would support me on that one. OK, so you're moving that we do an assessment on this particular piece of work. Uh, and the desktop exercise looking at how our procurement systems are, are roll out for the whole contract? In effect, yeah, with these specific cases in mind, yep. Okay, and that doesn't negate any further motion later on? Um, not that I know, but we'll, we'll come to that when we get to it. But I think I'm happy to do a, a one-off look into this with an independent assessor. Okay, so you've moved that. Do I have a seconder? That's the door. You're seconding. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you were speaking then. Yeah. It's okay. Um, all those in favour? Okay, that is carried. That's number one. Uh, Councillor Farrell. Thank you. Um, so number two says that an assessment be done for all repairs in advance of leaseholders being asked to contribute to repairs. Um, now, there's a resource issue to this, of course, but I think it's definitely possible. Uh, I'd like to consider this as an approach. Um, it may, of course, attract additional fees due to the resources that might be required. And it's not guaranteed, of course, to change the outcome. Um, I'd like to maybe put this back to the scrutiny committee to look at the implications because, you know, an assessment of all repairs in advance of leaseholders being asked to contribute is, is, a, is a very broad brush. Some repairs are much smaller than others. So the, the, there are lots of long term implications I can see towards the HOA budget with this. So I'd personally like to push that back to the committee for a bit of further work, possibly um, liaising with council officers of, of, the, of what the cost implications are to that one longer term. So I, I move we kind of keep going with that. It's a, it's, it's a great start and, and, and push that one forward. Okay, I'm mindful of the sixth recommendation that's been moved when considering that. Uh, so you're suggesting that we ask scrutiny to look further into the implications of assessing each of the repairs that affect that directly affect leaseholder properties. Yeah, I, I read this, and I hope I've got this wrong. I, I read this as a repairs in general um, point, and I know we're talking about these specific cases, but I think scrutiny needs to be a scrutiny for for the whole process as a whole, as opposed to just these specific cases. So I think we just need to. Personally, I would like to see the implications of that going forward, cost-wise. Um, I don't think it's just about cost, is it? But yeah, no. okay. So, so you're moving that uh, we request scrutiny to do some further work into the implications of assessing repairs in advance of scrutiny, uh, in advance of leaseholders being asked to contribute, ra rather than after the process. Okay. It's proposed. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Dawes seconds. All those in favour? Against? Chair, can, yep. I, can the wording not be changed? Because I, I see where you've come from with the recommendations, but it does say for all repairs. Is that what you meant to say? Or do you mean to say just the roofing repairs? Sorry, I just want I to clarify I, that. I think the roofing repairs comes under number six. Right, this okay. Is, I think this is all repairs. It might be at, come, Michelle. With the Chair's permission, if you can just kind of clarify what we meant. Because of the fact when... Um, issues such as the roofs are completed in advance of the works actually beginning there is an assessment that is undertaken at that point so the process of someone effectively going up a ladder and looking at something happens already within the process which the person then ultimately pays for as part of that process it's ultimately saying doing it at the start and if there is an associated cost invoicing the resident at that particular point for any um, assessment for that to happen rather than doing it at the end after going through all of the so uh, admittedly there may have to be some consultation that happens but before people are presented whether this has got to happen to you it's actually done at the start of that process rather than at the end that's what we were trying to get to if that helps thank you yeah, thank you councillor daniel cook 
Yeah, thank you for allowing us to clarify, Mr Chairman. Just to reiterate what these people are doing in this room. They've had letters telling them they might have to shell out £36,000 for a new roof and nobody's actually looked at it. That's what we're asking. Can somebody look at it first before we go upset some very rural new residents? That, that's what this recommendation is intended to do. If you want to caveat that of anything over £1,000 or anything over £2,000, we, we can discuss that. But what we're saying is don't go upset some very vulnerable residents over a three-year period before you've even looked at the roof. That, that's what we're asking. And it, it could be lifts, it could be paths, it could be walkways, it could be corridors, it could be lighting. Whatever it is, let's actually find out if there is a problem before we upset some very vulnerable people. It, it's not a hard question, I believe. Okay, thank you, Councillor Cook. Councillor Farrell. Yeah, completely take the point, Councillor Cook. Um, I, I'm just looking at the seven recommendations, and, and to me, uh, a few of them, specifically number six, falls within the specific case you're talking about. This, to me, I just read as a general point, um, not referring to this. So, yeah, I think maybe if the committee can go away and look at um, the implications on the different maybe price brackets or there's, there's other implications, as the leader said, not just cost, and then I'll try and tackle that point on number six, if that's okay. So... In terms of the motion you moved, Councillor Farrell, uh, and the clarification that Councillor Clement sought, uh, instead of referring that back to scrutiny at this point, do you want to reconsider this and put some flesh on the bones and then come back and either come back to scrutiny or come back to, to cabinet on this at a, at a later date? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to kind of um, bring that to the next um, available cabinet meeting and, and, and bring that out in its in its full detail, yeah. Okay. Uh, cabinet, are we happy with, with that? Yep. Okay, so we'll get that piece of work done and feedback. Uh, number three. Yeah, so number three says to reinforce the council's communications when residents buy a council house including uh, what responsibilities and obligations were on the owner-occupier. Uh, yep, support this in principle, definitely. Um, the council can't, of course, give legal advice, um, so the emphasis would still be on the buyer's solicitor to inform them. Um, but I'd quite like to move at this stage that the council writes to all local solicitors um, and, um, and reminds them of their responsibility to inform buyers, because I think uh, it sounds to me like either that hasn't been done or not, not done in in the way it should have done. Um, so I'll, I'll move that, leader. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you're suggesting we review that and we also contact local solicitors who are involved in purchase of leasehold properties. Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Chair. Just a, just a, a point of order on, on that particular thing. A lot of solicitors aren't actually local. Um, they're, they're nationwide. Uh, so it would be extremely difficult to contact every solicitor's practice that may deal with a, uh, a right to buy of a leasehold. Um, I, I don't disagree. The comms um, need, to, need to get there, um, but I'm not quite sure how we can do that, given that as an organisation we can't give any, uh, any legal advice, because um, that obviously sets the, the, the council liable for, for that advice, which we are, are not able to. Um, but I'm sure there's, there's, there's something that can be done with that. But I'd, to, but I'd perhaps be wary of just writing to local solicitors because quite, you know, quite often it's, it, they're not local, so the message wouldn't get out. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Barrett. Uh, Councillor Farrell. Yeah, completely uh, take the Chief Executive's point. Um, maybe we could, um, if Cabinet's happy, we could, we could go away and, and, and work behind the scenes and work out how we can get the comms out there to, um, to people and, and maybe put something in place um, that um, that we can review at a later date around the legal communications, if Cabinet's happy with that. Cabinet happy with that position? Okay, thank you. Uh, number four. Yep, yeah, number four, that communications relating to leaseholder works be reviewed and simplified. Um, simple, yes, happy to review, uh, agree. Um, I move that we review the communications uh, and also include the whole capital program in our communications. Um, um, by that I mean if, if we've got a, a schedule of works for the next 10, 15, 20 years, um, I think that um, people should be um, notified of that. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Okay, comment on that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the, we have the capital program. Uh, we have a 30-year business plan in the HRA, so we've got a good idea what's coming up. We have the capital programme, which is a five-year programme. Uh, so so we, we should know what repairs are due in four years' time. Uh, and if they affect leaseholders, that should be the start of the conversation. 
not at the time we decide to do works. So fully support that one. Uh, also, so take that for review, include the capital programme. Uh, way back on the 4th of April uh, 2018, uh, I had the pleasure of chairing a scrutiny meeting uh, and one of the recommendations uh, that came out of that was uh, was questioning the formality of the letters that we send to residents. Uh, and we very often hide behind, oh, well, the law says we have to deliver this letter in this section and this, that and the other. Uh, and, and I asked for, back in 2018, uh, that we use plain English uh, and explain the situation and break down barriers. Uh, I'm going to digress slightly uh, to another letter that we send out regularly from Tamworthborough Council, which relates to uh, housing uh, council house tenants. Uh, and the letter we send out is, uh, you, are in you are in rent arrears. If you do not do not pay it, we will seek to evict you. What we should be saying is, you're in rent arrears. Give us a call and let's see what we can do. That was 2018. I'm disappointed that five years later we're still having similar conversations. So yeah, fully support. We need to have a review of the letters that go out. We need to keep them legal, but we also need to keep them human. Uh, and as I say, we've got a four-year, a five-year-plus capital programme, so we know what's coming up. So we need to communicate it better. So uh, consider yourself told, Councillor Farrell. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll support that we we take that away and we include that. Uh, that capital program so if you've moved that i'm happy to second all those in favor of coming up okay that is carried thank you very much i'll stop ranting now <laughs> councillor farrell happy to hear your rants um so number five was that the contractor holds at least two face-to-face -face consultation drop-ins to enable residents to understand the process um yep yeah, i like this idea it can be arranged um we just need to again be mindful of the costs associated with this um that will be met from the contract um and leaseholders obviously will need to recognize that this will sit outside the formal section 20 consultation process and i say that it's almost ties in with the last one about comms you know we we need to issue um the correct legal wording to, to protect everybody involved um you know um we need to ensure that um informal conversations that take place um are clearly informal as opposed to the formal um conversations but um the process itself i, I like the idea of i probably suggest we push that back to scrutiny to look at more implications of it because again um you know do you have a, a two face-to-face -face consultations for for a job that's under a thousand pound as an example so I, I kind of go to my earlier point um i'd like the the committee to look at that more but i do like the idea of it so I, nothing specifically to move from me here but just thank you for that idea and maybe we'll flesh it out a bit more in the future uh, and, and request Requests should scrutiny consider uh, should scrutiny want to they consider where the thresholds are. Mm. So, if it affects over X number of leaseholders or it's over a certain value, yeah, Correct. okay, yeah. okay, okay. So we'll ask scrutiny to re uh, to do a bit more work on that and consider that. Uh, item six is the one I referred to a number of times in the earlier recommendations. So item six, Alex. Yep. Yeah, so item six says that the specific forty four leaseholder roofs be assessed straight away. And um, now I understand that. The 44 roofs have been surveyed already if that's not the case of any property please do let us know um but yes um i i agree it's um it, they need to be assessed straight away i agree with this okay so you understand they have been done so the motion is for, for to seek clarity that they have and if they haven't these 44 roofs or these these roofs in question are surveyed immediately. Correct, yes. Okay. Happy to, whoever's moving or seconding that. I move that, yeah. Okay, happy to second that. Uh, Councillor Cook, Chris, uh, Danny Cook. Sorry, um, as we understood it, and the uh, assets director himself said it in a scrutiny meeting, it stands a very, 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 very good chance none of these roofs have actually been looked at. It's potential one or two have because of the nature of how stock condition surveys are done. We understand the process to then show, once the residents have been consulted with, then an assessment is done. The officer has already admitted these roofs have not been assessed. We need to get these roofs assessed. That's where we are. So, and yeah. also, sorry, just to interrupt, also looking around at when that comment was made, the amount of people that have shaken their heads in the audience would indicate that they haven't. So just to clarify that, thank you for the interruption. Yeah, happy to pick that up. Um, the, uh, the, uh, 
potentially there's a, um, a bit of a wording miscommunication here because I've been told that the roofs have been surveyed. If they've not been surveyed or assessed, if there's a difference, then then apologies. But I, I assure everybody that we'll um, get on to the assessment uh, as soon as possible. Yep, so if they haven't, we will do immediately. Correct. Okay. Okay, happy with that? I think there's moving second. All in favour? Okay, thank you. And number seven. Yeah, the last one was that the council consider a mechanism such that the affected 44 leaseholders were not faced with increased costs as a result of the delay in the work being commenced. Uh, yep, happy to recommend to Cabinet that we write off the impacts of delaying these works. Um, uh, so I move that we write off any additional costs that may be accrued because of the delays to the process. Okay, uh, appreciate where you're coming from on that and don't have any objections to that. However, I'm going to seek advice uh, from Mr. Barrett. Uh, in order to waive that and stay within financial regs, do we need a report to come to the next cabinet meeting to do that officially? We'll need to consider the uh, the impacts because clearly the housing revenue account can't pick up costs associated with uh, private dwellings. So we, if if, if it's cabinet's desire to do so um, we'll have to take it away and do some work with that to um, to, to see what what the art of the possible is um, it may result in an, another report it may be something we can do under current governance but I think understand the principle okay so if we can do it I think the cabinet wants you to proceed uh, and if we do need to follow in report at the next cabinet meeting then can you please get that report organized councillor Oates sorry <laughs> councillor Cook yeah, sorry, Mr Chairman, if, if it helps the committee at all, there is already a precedent set for this. In 2018, two sets of lift broke in the same building in the high-rise flats. I took a decision as leader of the council that actually we weren't going to build a residence for both lifts at once. There is a precedent already set that the leader or the deputy leader of the council can just instruct that. Okay, thank you for that information. All those in favour? Okay, thank you. So, report or, if possible, we'll sort that out. Okay, that concludes the seven recommendations from overview and scrutiny. Uh, so thank everybody for their input, thank the working group uh, for the work they've done uh, during the working group time. And uh, I know particularly Councillor Chris Cook got involved very early on uh, prior, prior to that working group being, being formed. So thank you very much for your input. Thank you. Okay, we are going to move on to agenda item six and the rest of the agenda. Uh, thank the audience for coming. Please feel free to stay if you so desire. Um, I've struggled to get councillors here. <laughs> but no, thank you for, for coming this evening. Okay then, councillors, uh, we will continue with the rest of the agenda. So agenda item six is the corporate vision, priorities plan, budget and MTFS. Uh, this has already been through cabinet uh, a number of times. In fact, the last cabinet meeting, we considered that iteration uh, and this is the final iteration. Uh, and the request is that we approve this to be sent to full council next Tuesday for consideration. Uh, so, as we've been through it a number of times, I didn't really want to, to go through in much detail this evening. Um, the report varies very slightly uh, from the last time we met. Uh, however, you'll remember that we're in a, a, a balanced situation 
uh, for the three years then. Uh, we've considered a number of policy changes, we've considered different options uh, and the potential for, <coughs> for variance in, in, in income uh, as, as well as expenditure over the, over the period of the plan. Uh, and we're at a situation now where we, we have a, a budget which I believe is suitable to recommend to full council. So I'm not going to say any more on it and I'm going to move uh, the recommendations. Uh, Councillor Farrell. Happy to second and support those. Okay, any other questions or comments from Cabinet? In that case, it's been moved and seconded. There are a whole plethora of recommendations. So all those in favour? That's carried, thank you very much. And that will be referred to full council next week. Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me. Agenda item seven is the quarter three performance report. <coughs> I took this through uh, corporate scrutiny a short time ago. Uh, not sure if it was last week or the week before. It was, it was recent. Um, and I can report back that the, ca the, the committee were full of praise for the progress made in the report uh, and content uh, with the direction uh, of performance and the contents of the report. A um, couple of things that were highlighted uh, and discussed in committee. Uh, one in particular was the, uh, was the only amber in the corporate projects, uh, and that relates to the Corporation Street Gateway project. Um, there was a bit of a conversation as to how we proceed on that. Uh, and I think that the, the final conclusion uh, from corporate scrutiny was uh, that the, the, the cabinets are aware of the situation with Corporation Street and should therefore uh, go ahead and decide what happens to that project. Uh, so with that, uh, what I would suggest is that we support the contents of the project and move that the Gateways project around Corporation Street uh, be removed as a corporate project uh, from the from the projects in order for it to be reviewed and reassessed uh, in the in the current in the current climate as opposed to the original project which was three years ago. So, any questions or comments on that or the quarter three performance report? Okay, so I move that we accept the report and that we remove the Corporation Street Gateways project. Uh, as a corporate project and review that project as a gateway. All those, uh, do I have a seconder? Councillor Clement seconds. All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. And that brings me on to agenda item eight, which is the Future High Street Fund quarterly, uh, quarterly update. Uh, this has also been through scrutiny. It went through infrastructure, safety and growth uh, recently. Um, so the report gives an update on the situation as to where we're at with the different projects. Uh, and it breaks it down into the different areas. So South Staffordshire College uh, plan application has been approved uh, subject to conditions and, and signing of the, the agreement in October. Uh, and the, the, the procurement exercise uh, has begun in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the new build. In terms of our bit, uh, the co-op retail store, the de demolition uh, has, has already started. Uh, and you'll notice the, the building is wrapped in, in film at the moment. Uh, there's a couple of gaps where you can see through. I had a look through last week and there was a torrent of water falling through the middle of the building, so I assume they were draining something uh, and nothing catastrophic had gone wrong. Uh, but uh, the demolition is, is proceeding with that. Uh, and if you look at the site from uh, Coal Hill, you'll see actually there's a significant amount of the building has already been removed uh, at the back, which we, we, we can't see from the, uh, from St. Edith's Square. So that's, that's progressing well. Um, the main tender for the Enterprise Centre uh, has, has gone out uh, and uh, we should be in a position uh, to announce a contractor very shortly for that's the Enterprise Centre which will look after the Victorian part of the building uh, and the strip out is continuing with that. Uh, in terms of St Edith's Square which is the public realm elements uh, which put onto, uh, excuse me, put onto the, the co-op building or what will be the college. Uh, We've had a number of final designs uh, for St. Edith's Square, which are going to change the whole look uh, of the area. And you'll notice that the canopy was removed uh, in, in November, which has opened up that, that area, uh, recreating that, that big space that was created uh, in the 60s. Uh, middle entry, uh, we are still dealing with uh, a number of things in relation to middle entry. Uh, and the planning application uh, has been approved. Uh, for the flex units which will replace the shops at the rear of the town hall. Again, the landscape architects uh, are looking at the, the public realm space in front of those uh, and creating a new square uh, for, 
for, for people to dwell as they transition from Market Street and George Street through to, to St Editha Square through the, the newly opened up uh, middle entry uh, which will have the bridge units and the roof removed. Um, plan application for the PR Cafe has been, refu been approved uh, and the tender for refurbishment is live uh, and we've also passed the, uh, the designs for that. Now in terms of the, the old buildings which are pretty much over my left shoulder uh, in Market Street, a heritage structural engineer uh, has released some final recommendations uh, as to how we can uh, bring those back into use uh, and some further survey work and opening up works uh, is to take place on those. Uh, we mustn't forget that part of the original bid for Future Charge Street Fund was to bring those back into some sort of use and operation uh, and we're continuing to do that. Um, the other significant issue, which it sounds insignificant, but when, it's, uh, when it stops you putting a new bridge in, it, it, it jumps out, is Western Power uh, distribution, have cables running underneath the wooden bridge that goes from the castle grounds to Market Street. Uh, and we now have a, an agreement in place, which means we don't have to move those so we can move forward on, uh, on those. Uh, so the plan in terms of the budget and timescales is pretty much where we'd expect to be at this point uh, in the project. Uh, we are forecasting an increase in construction costs uh, of around £2 million uh, due to uh, inflation and the rising costs of materials. We've been discussing this since, whoa, right at the start, since we really got awarded the cash, uh, and there is a £2 million contingency fund allocated across the programme. Uh, so in terms of that, there's a £2 million contingency fund, but at every stage we are reviewing what we are trying to achieve. So some of you will remember early artist impressions of the flex units at the back of the town hall. Uh, the approved design which went through planning is significantly different from those artist impressions. And the reason it's significantly different is we've used that design opportunity to limit the costs, uh, uh, limit the increase in costs of, uh, of the project. So therefore we're still achieving what we want to, we're just not necessarily getting the original design uh, that, that we were looking at in the, uh, in the first place. Uh, so that's uh, that's where we're at with quarter with the quarterly updates on the future Street fund. Any questions or comments from cabinet, Castle Doyle? I'd <coughs> Excuse me. I'd just like to make the comment as part of this falls into my portfolio. Um, the development around middle entry and also tech two. I'm really looking forward to seeing come online. I mean, it's going to provide um, opportunities for developing businesses within Tamworth. And from inquiries that I've made in the past, um, even with Tech One, we've got people coming in from outside of the borough who want to be in Tamworth because of the support they're getting. I've actually got a personal friend that's moved from North Warwickshire to Tamworth because of the amount of support that's given to businesses. And uh, with the changes in middle entry, that'll offer some opportunities to put in retail as well. So. I'd happily second that report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dorn, and thank you for your comments. I think your, your comments around the, the Enterprise Centre are absolutely spot on. Uh, the Tech 1 is oversubscribed. Uh, we have a waiting list. Uh, tech 2 is going to be slightly slightly different, larger, different opportunities. Um, but, uh, but I'm sure that will take off in just the same way. Uh, and what we have noticed as a, as a secondary benefit to Tech 1 being open is there's been an improvement in the private sector offer for office space in, in Tamworth. So, so not only have we provided opportunity, but we've also driven the market and, in, and improved, the, uh, improved the quality of what's on offer in Tamworth. Councillor Dorn. Further comments? Mm -hmm. um, with everything that's going on, it provides a very good opportunity for business within Tamworth because you're going to have the college there with students uh, taking the skills that they learn, some of them looking to develop their own businesses, which is quite common now. The opportunity to move into Tech One, where they can see if their business takes hold and develops traction, and then if it further develops, move into the likes of Tech Two, where they're able to expand as well. So it's the sort of things that previously you'd only see in more, uh, more affluent parts of uh, the country, but it's coming to Tamworth and everything is in place to make this work. So I'm really, really excited about this. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Councillor Doyle. So I've proposed it and Councillor Doyle has seconded. All those in favour? Okay, thank you very much. That carries that one.
Uh, which brings me on to agenda item nine, which is a review of fees and charges. This is the annual review uh, of, of fees and charges. Uh, the recommendations are that we implement uh, the annual inflationary increase for the fees and charges uh, from the 1st of April on there, detailed in Appendix 1, uh, and to endorse the increase in the charges applied to goods sold through the catering bar and shops throughout the year, uh, and these are based on cost price plus margin. Uh, if you look at Appendix two, Appendix 1 of the report, uh, you'll see it's colour-coded, so all those prices inc price increases uh, that are in line with inflation are highlighted in green. Uh, all those which are new charges are highlighted in uh, yellow. And those who are below inflation are highlighted in blue. Uh, there's quite a few listed in there. Uh, a lot of them relate to the assembly rooms uh, and outdoor events, but there's also uh, some, of the other, uh, some of the other fees that we, uh, that we apply, such as uh, in relation to cemeteries. Uh, you'll also notice that a number of them are statutory so therefore we have no opportunity to, to vary the price on those uh, so they're all listed there uh, happy to take any questions or comments okay so i'll move recommendations one and two all uh, do i have a seconder seconded by councillor Doyle. all those in favor that is carried thank you very much and that brings me on to agenda item 10 which is uh, comments Comments, compliments, complaints, and managing unreasonable customer behaviour policies. Uh, this is the portfolio holder for finance, risk, and customer services. However, we have received their apologies, so I'm going to ask Councillor Doyle to introduce this report. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I'd first off like to start uh, by thanking the report author, Nicola Hesketh. Um, the purpose of this report is to seek Cabinet approval uh, for the compliments, comments and complaints and managing unreasonable customer, be customer behaviour policies. In summary, the comments, compliments and complaints policy replaces the current Tell Us policy, which has been in place since 2012. The main drivers for the policy being updated in, uh, is the Ombudsman best practice and it is also introduces new requirements of the Housing Ombudsman in respect of response times which should give an enhanced service standard to customers. It has a focus on learning from complaints to enhance our customer experience, which given what we've just dis discussed tonight would be quite handy. The two uh, Ombudsmen have different codes which need to be adhered to, so this policy reflects the best position for the customer. Overall, there is no significant change to the process for how to make a complaint. The two-stage approach will remain, as will the right to escalate a complaint to an uh, omnibusman, where the customer remains dissatisfied. Tamworth Borough Council has a low volume of uh, complaints referred to uh, in this direction, and many are not upheld. We continue to take advice on board where decisions are upheld against us and make service improvements as appropriate. The report contains a section that highlights the key differences between this policy and the TELUS it replaces, which is available online. The report contains a section, oh, sorry, um, for reference, there is in Appendix 1, there is a copy of the comments, complaint, uh, compliments and complaints policy, and in Appendix 2, there is the managing unreasonable customer behaviour policy. The Managing Unreasonable Customer Behaviour Policy has been in place since 2017. To note, it works alongside the other policy and it has been reviewed with only minor changes made to job titles and responsibilities. So the recommendations I propose or move to Cabinet are as follows, on behalf of Marie Bailey. First, approve the comments, compliments and complaints policy for implementation on the 1st of April 2023. And secondly, approve the Managing Unreasonable Customer Behaviour Policy for implementation on the 1st of April 2023. Thank you. Any questions or comments from Cabinet? Uh, the only thing that, that jumps out at me, and it jumps out at me every time we, we look at, uh, at complaints and, and, and compliments and comments, um, is very often the public will approach the complaints procedure as a way of requesting service. Uh, now, I know when we get the, the annual report from Ombudsman, 
that that's that's highlighted and isolated and we can understand that um i just wondered if there was anything we could add in terms of uh or you could advise me in terms of this process in front of us here where we can pick up that service request and and identify it rather than a, a comment compliment or or complaint Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> the process that we have, the internal process, which sits in the information governance team, the first thing that the team look at is, is it truly a complaint or is it a service request? If it's service request, then it gets referred to the appropriate service and it is followed up as well to make sure that the resident does get a response as a service request uh, rather than it going through the complaints. But this is something that we have improved since the process has sat in the information governance team. Excellent. So not only are we, are we picking up the service requests, we're also getting a feel for the for the level of demand. And um, the information governance manager actually is collating the information of the types of service request, so we get a feel of where they're coming from, so that we can provide insight to the organisation to improve our processes and service. Excellent. Thank you. Any further questions or comments from Cabinet? No, Councillor Doyle has moved those two recommendations. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Clement seconds. All those in favour? Okay, that is carried. Thank you very much. And that brings me on to agenda item 11, uh, which is write-offs 1st of April 22 to 31st of December 22. Uh, again, this is in the name of the Portfolio Holder for Finance, Risk and Customer Service. Uh, however, as we have their apologies, I'm again going to ask Councillor Doyle to introduce this report. Thank you very much, Chairman. I've been hearing this report for 11 years and it's my time to deliver it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank Mike Buckland, who's the author of the report. Um, this uh, report proposes members endorse the amount of debt written off for the period of 1st of April 2022 to the 31st of December 2022. In summary, the heads of service are responsible for the regular reviews and, and debts and consider the need for write-off and authorise when necessary appropriate write-offs in line with the uh, corporate credit policy. A revised approach to the calculation of business rates but debt has been developed which involves a review of all outstanding debts to ascertain whether they are likely to be collectible. It should be noted that at present we would not consider the write-off of debts unless we have examined all of the po uh, possible options and refer to the writing off of debts as a last resort. The levels of write-offs can be found in Appendix 1 of this report, write-offs 1, um, 1st of April 2022 to the 31st of December. Uh, the recommendations, or the recommendation I propose to Cabinet and move is, one, endorse the amount of debt written off uh, for the period of the 1st of April 2022 to the 31st of December 2022, which are detailed in Appendix A and E, and approve the write-off of of irrecoverable debt for business rates of £83,075.98 in Appendix F, respectively. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Doyle, and well done on presenting that after 11 years of waiting. <laughs> Any questions or comments on the write-offs? No, it's a report we get regularly, uh, and I can assure people that I know uh, the finance team uh, and recoveries team at Townsborough Council are vociferous, is that the right word? Um, they, they, they won't let anything lie. So whilst this is being written off in terms of our accounting procedure, if there's a slightest sniff that we can get this money out of people, they will pursue it and they, they will recover it. So uh, please be assured that uh, whilst we're writing this off now, it doesn't mean we're forgetting about the debt. Councillor Dorr. When I originally picked up this and agreed to write the speech for it, I actually uh, hesitated over the wording for that particular aspect. It's what you call it, it, it can be said in a very heartless manner, but what this doesn't show is the amount of work that's put in uh, by various agencies, such as Citizens Advice, our own housing team, where we have issues in recovering debt but we work with those individuals to get them back on track so they're able to repay their debts under their own steam, which is better for them and it's better for us as well. Um, so I think that should also be captured. Thank you. I think you're yeah, absolutely right. Thank you, Councillor Dorr. Uh, so you've moved the recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Clements, all those in favour? 
that is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, that concludes the business of this evening's Cabinet meeting. So thank everybody uh, for their input and time. Uh, and I'll close the meeting there and wish you all a safe journey home. Thank you very much. <laughs>